Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, November 6th through the 12th, Hebrews 7 through 13, and High Priest of Good Things to Come. Wednesday, November 8th, 2023, Hebrews 10. By the blood ye are sanctified. Elder Brewster McConkie said, as he now concludes this portion of his presentation, Paul summarizes his teachings on the law of sacrifice in this way. One, salvation is in Christ and comes through the shedding of his blood. Men are sanctified through his blood and in no other way. Two, the sacrifices of the Mosaic law were types and shadows of our Lord's atoning sacrifice and were to point Israel's attention forward to that transcendent event. Three, animal sacrifices standing alone of themselves without more were imperfect and neither remitted sins nor brought salvation. Rather, they had efficacy and virtue only because of Christ's sacrifice. Four, sacrifices are now done away in Christ. Five, and thus is fulfilled the Lord's promise through Jeremiah that in a day subsequent to the law of Moses, God would give a new covenant which would abolish the sins and iniquities of the people. Hebrews 10.1 For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered continually year by year make the comers thereunto perfect. Paul returns here to a former theme, namely that perfection cannot come either by the law of Moses or by the lesser priesthood which administers that law. The law, says Peter, is but a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things themselves. This is true, he argues, because Mosaic sacrifice for sin must be repeated daily, whereas Christ's atoning act was once for all. Hebrews 10, 2-3 for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Paul used certain words to show how the sacrifices and practices of the law of Moses served as types or similitudes of things to come. Patterns, figures, shadow and image, and remembrance. The Old Testament priestly duties and temple sacrifices pointed to Jesus Christ's great atoning sacrifice. Hebrews 10.4 For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Elder Brewster McConkie said, quoting Alma 34.10-11, It is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, yea, not a sacrifice of man, neither a beast, neither of any manner of fowl, for it shall not be a human sacrifice, but it must be an infinite and eternal sacrifice. Now there is not any man who can sacrifice his own blood, which will atone for the sins of another. Paul quotes Psalm 40, 6 through 8, as found in the Subjugant, rather than the King James Version, which messianic prophecy proclaims, in thought content, that when the Lord comes into mortality to dwell in the body prepared for him, sacrifices and burnt offerings will be done away. This was affirmed in plain words to the Nephites by the risen Lord. Ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away, for I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Hebrews 10.5 Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith sacrifice and offering, Thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to a body hast thou prepared me, said, This phrase is not found in the prophecy as it is recorded in the King James Version, but it is found in the same prophecy in the subjugant. Paul's use of it certifies of its verity, and it is certainly an expressive and clear pronouncement relative to our Lord's birth into mortality. Hebrews 10, 6-9 In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin Thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither haddest pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh the way the first, that he may establish the second. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, said, The law of sacrifice is done away in Christ, 
he took away the rights required in the Mosaic law that he might establish the preeminence of his own atoning sacrifice. Hebrews 10.10, 10, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce M. McConkie, referring to we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, said, The atonement of Christ is the rock foundation upon which all things rest, which pertain to salvation and eternal life. Hence the Lord said to Adam, By the blood ye are sanctified. Although the usual scriptural pronouncement is that men are sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost. The meaning is that although men are sanctified by the power of the Holy Ghost, such sanctifying process is effective and operative because of the shedding of the blood of Christ. Thus Moroni says that the faithful saints are sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of their sins, that they become holy and without spot. The epistle to the Hebrews repeatedly emphasizes the difference between sacrifices under the law of Moses, which had to be offered over and over again, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which was made once for all. President Russell M. Nelson explained how the Savior's one-time offering was infinite in its scope. Jesus Christ's atonement is infinite, without an end. It was also infinite in that all humankind would be saved from never-ending death. It was infinite in terms of his immense suffering. It was infinite in time, putting an end to the preceding prototype of animal sacrifice. It was infinite in scope. It was to be done once for all. Hebrews 10, 11, And every priest standeth daily, ministering, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to sacrifices, which can never take away sins, said, Of themselves they cannot. The law of Moses alone is not enough. Forgiveness comes through the atonement of Christ, but the faithful compliance of ancient Israel with the laws of the Lord did sanctify them before him because of the atonement which was to be. Hebrews 10, 12-14 But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, quoting Alma 34, 13-15, said, It is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, and then shall there be, or it is expedient that there should be, a stop to the shedding of blood. Then shall the law of Moses be fulfilled. Yea, it shall be all fulfilled, every jot and tittle, and none shall have passed away. And behold, this is the whole meaning of the law, every wit pointing to that great and last sacrifice. And that great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. And thus he shall bring salvation to all those who shall believe on his name, this being the intent of his last sacrifice, to bring about the bowels of mercy, which overpowereth justice, and bringeth about means unto men, that they may have faith unto repentance. Hebrews ten fifteen through 18 Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, This argument is persuasive, since the new covenant coming after the law of Moses was to free men from sin. Why then continue the old covenant to do what is now accomplished by the new? Those who fall from grace are damned. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Ye saints of God, since Christ our Lord has redeemed us by his blood, since he has made salvation available through the new gospel covenant, since he as the high priest over the church now opens to us the door to his kingdom, since we have cast off the sins of the world through his blood and are now clean before him, let us keep the commandments, let us hold fast to the church, let us lead and guide each other to do good works. Let us meet together often and exhort each other in the cause of righteousness. Hebrews 10, 19-20 To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. The ancient tabernacle and the temples patterned thereafter had veils which separated one portion of the structure from another. To pass the first veil was to move from the outer court into an inner sanctuary known as the holy place. To pass the second veil 
was to enter the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. Paul capitalizes on the Hebrew understanding of these things to indicate symbolically the role of Jesus in making it possible for us to enter into heaven, our Holy of Holies. As in ancient times the high priest entered the earthly sanctuary through rites of purification, so we too are privileged to enter the heavenly sanctuary through the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from sin. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Atonement for sin is no longer made by the high priest in Israel when he passes through the veil of the temple into the Holy of Holies. Now there is a new way, a living way, for the veil of the old temple was rent with the crucifixion. Now Jesus has passed through the veil into heaven itself. While he lived, his mortal flesh stood between him and the eternal holy of holies. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But now he has, as it were, rent the veil of his flesh through death and entered into the fullness of his father's kingdom through resurrection. Having established the image of Jesus Christ as high priest entering into the holy of holies, or the presence of God, to intercede for us through his blood, Paul then exhorted his readers to follow Christ into God's presence. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Just as the veil of the ancient tabernacle or temple provided access to the Holy of Holies, in Paul's metaphor, the flesh of Jesus Christ, offered as a sacrifice for sin and raised to resurrected glory, enables us to enter into God's presence. In each case, this was the only means provided to enter. For more information on the veil, see the commentary from Matthew 2751. Use this key as a reference for this section. This is not at all all-inclusive, but just a few quotes that I brought in to go with this section. The Holy of Holies was the most sacred room in the ancient temple. It symbolized the presence of God. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest passed through the veil of the temple and entered into the Holy of Holies, where he sprinkled the blood of a sin offering to atone for the sins of all the congregation of Israel. When the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or torn in two, at the death of Jesus Christ, it was a dramatic symbol that the Savior, the great high priest, had passed through the veil of death and would shortly enter into the presence of God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote that in addition to the Savior entering the presence of the Father, the Holy of Holies is now open to all, and all, through the atoning blood of the Lamb, can now enter into the highest and holiest of all places, that kingdom where eternal life is found. Paul, in expressive language, shows how the ordinances performed through the veil of the ancient temple were in similitude of what Christ was to do, which he now, having done, all men become eligible to pass through the veil into the presence of the Lord to inherit full exaltation. The Apostle Paul taught that just as the torn veil of the temple allowed symbolic entrance into the Holy of Holies, it is the torn flesh of Jesus Christ that opens the way for us into the presence of the Father. Hebrews 10.20 By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Having established the image of Jesus Christ as high priest entering into the Holy of Holies or the presence of God to intercede for us through his blood, Paul then exhorted his readers to follow Christ into God's presence by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Just as the veil of the ancient tabernacle or temple provided access to the Holy of Holies in Paul's metaphor, the flesh of Jesus Christ offered as a sacrifice for sin and raised to resurrected glory enables us to enter into God's presence. In each case, this was the only means provided to enter. President Spencer W. Kimball said, I have learned that where there is a prayerful heart, a hungering after righteousness, a forsaking of sins, and obedience to the commandments of God, the Lord pours out more and more light until there is finally power to pierce the heavenly veil. A person of such righteousness has the priceless promise that one day he shall see the Lord's face and know that he is. President Russell M. Nelson said, The house of the Lord is a house of learning. There the Lord teaches in his own way. There each ordinance teaches about the Savior. There we learn how to part the veil and communicate more clearly with heaven. And to each of you who has made temple covenants, I plead with you to seek prayerfully and consistently to understand temple covenants and ordinances. Spiritual doors will open. You will learn how to part the veil between heaven and earth. 
how to ask for God's angels to attend you, and how better to receive direction from heaven. DNC 6710, and again verily I say unto you that it is your privilege, and a promise I give unto you, that have been ordained unto this ministry, that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me, for ye are not sufficiently humble, the veil shall be rent, and you shall see me and know that I am, not with the carnal neither natural mind, but with the spiritual. In both the ancient and modern times, the veil of the temple has symbolized separation from the presence of the Lord. The Lord promised the elders who were in attendance at the conference that if they stripped themselves of jealousies and fears and humbled themselves, the veil between him and them would be rent, and they would see and know him. The Lord explained that no one has seen him except those who had been quickened or spiritually enlivened by the Spirit of God, because the natural or mortal man cannot abide his presence, although the Lord declared that the elders were not sufficiently ready to receive such a glorious blessing at the time. He encouraged them to continue in patience until they were perfected. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency explained the role of patience in becoming perfected. Without patience, we cannot please God. We cannot become perfect. Indeed, patience is a purifying process that refines understanding, deepens happiness, focuses attention, and offers hope for peace. Patience means active waiting and enduring. It means staying with something and doing all that we can working, hoping, and exercising faith, bearing hardship with fortitude, even when the desires of our hearts are delayed. Patience is not simply enduring, it is enduring well. Patience is a godly attribute that can heal souls, unlock treasures of knowledge and understanding, and transform ordinary men and women into saints and angels. Patience is a process of perfection. The Savior himself said that in your patience you possess your souls. Or to use another translation of the Greek text, in your patience you win mastery of your souls. Patience means to abide in faith, knowing that sometimes it is in the waiting rather than in the receiving that we grow the most. Third Nephi 15 Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me and endure to the end, and ye shall live. For unto him that endureth to the end will I give eternal life. Eternal life or exaltation is to live in God's presence. Revelations 22.13 I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. One remarkable truth of the restored gospel is that the heavens are not sealed, that God still speaks to his children and reveals his will to them. And one amazing aspect of that knowledge is that God will reveal himself to individuals who meet certain prerequisites. The scriptures record that many ancient prophets saw God, and the present dispensation was opened by a vision to which God and Christ appeared to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove. But several places in the Doctrine and Covenants, including section 67, teach that this privilege is not reserved for prophets alone, but for anyone willing to pay the price required in personal righteousness. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that after a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say to him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him, and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards. Then the man will find his calling and his election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints. Now what is this other comforter? It is no more or less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and this is the sum and substance of the whole matter, that when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or to appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him. And the visions of the heavens will be opened unto him, and the Lord will teach him face to face. And he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Such a privilege does not come easily. A high level of righteousness and commitment must be demonstrated in the life of an individual 
before God will appear to him. And yet, step by step, a person can reach that degree. The prophet Joseph Smith taught how this growth can occur. We consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect, and that the nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater are his enjoyments, till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin, and like the ancients arrives at that point of faith where he is wrapped in the power and glory of his maker and is caught up to dwell with him. But we consider that this is a station to which no man ever arrived in a moment. He must have been instructed in the government and laws of that kingdom by proper degrees. Until his mind is capable in some measure of comprehending the propriety, justice, equality, and consistency of the same. Joseph Smith said, make your calling and election sure. What is the secret? The starting point. According to as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How did he obtain all things? Through the knowledge of him who hath called him. There could not anything be given pertaining to life and godliness without knowledge. Woe, woe, woe to Christendom, especially the divines and priests, if this be true. Salvation is for a man to be saved from all his enemies, for until a man can triumph over death, he is not saved. A knowledge of the priesthood alone will do this. 1 Corinthians 13 For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. D&C 110.1 The veil was taken from our minds, and our eyes of our understanding were opened. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said these statements about the two comforters climax and crown the teachings of the Son of God. We have no record of anything he ever said which can so completely withdraw the curtain of eternity and open to the faithful a vision of the glories of God. Based on love, born of obedience, Jesus promises the saints that they can have here and now in this life the following. One, the gift and constant companionship of the Holy Ghost the comfort and peace which is in the function of that Holy Spirit to bestow, the revelation and the sanctifying power which alone will prepare men for the companionship of gods and angels hereafter, two personal visitations from the second comforter, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the resurrected and perfected being who dwells with the Father in the mansions on high, and three, God the Father, mark it well, Philip, shall visit man in person, take up his abode with him, as it were, and reveal to him all the hidden mysteries of his kingdom. D&C 131.5 The more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. During his sermon at Yalrom, the prophet Joseph Smith also spoke about the more sure word of prophecy mentioned in 2 Peter 1.19. He taught the saints in that settlement that a more sure word of prophecy is a confirmation from the Spirit that allows a person to know that his or her calling and election has been made sure. It is reassurance given to faithful followers of Jesus Christ that they were sealed in the heavens and had the promise of eternal life in the kingdom of God. He explained that this knowledge would be as an anchor to the soul sure and steadfast, though the thunders might roll and lightnings flash, and earthquakes bellow, and war gather thick around. Yet this hope and knowledge would support the soul in every hour of trial, trouble, and tribulation. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Those members of the church who devote themselves wholly to righteousness, living by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, make their calling and election sure. That is, they receive the more sure word of prophecy, which means that the Lord seals their exaltation upon them while they are yet in this life. Peter summarized the course of righteousness which the saints must pursue to make their calling and election sure, and then, referring to his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John, said that those three had received this more sure word of prophecy. 
those so favored of the Lord are sealed up against all manner of sin and blasphemy, except the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and the shedding of innocent blood. That is, their exaltation is assured. Their calling and election is made sure. Because they have obeyed the fullness of God's laws and have overcome the world. President Russell M. Nelson said, what does it mean to overcome the world? It means to overcome the temptation to care more about the things of this world than the things of God. It means trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. It means choosing to refrain from anything that drives the spirit away. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Those who press forward in righteousness, living by every word of revealed truth, have power to make their calling and election sure. They receive the more sure word of prophecy and know by revelation and the authority of the priesthood that they are sealed up unto eternal life. President Joseph Fielding Smith also said, If a man gets knowledge enough to have the companionship of the Son of God, the chances are his call and election would be sure. Joseph Smith Jr. said, first key, knowledge is the power of salvation. Second key, make your calling and election sure. Third key, it is one thing to be on the mount and hear the excellent voice, etc., and another to hear the voice declare to you, you have a part and lot in that kingdom. What is the kingdom Jesus was speaking about? Elder D. Todd Christopherson taught, when Daniel interpreted the dream of Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, making known to the king what shall be in the latter days. He declared that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all other kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The church is that prophesied latter-day kingdom, not created by man, but set up by God of heaven and rolling forth as a stone cut out of the mountain without hands to fill the earth. Its destiny is to establish Zion in preparation for the return and millennial rule of Jesus Christ. Before that day, it will not be a kingdom in any political sense. As the Savior said, my kingdom is not of this world. Rather, it is the repository of his authority in the earth, the administration of his holy covenants, the custodian of his temples, the protector and proclaimer of his truth, the gathering place of scattered Israel, and a defense and a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out, without mixture upon the whole earth. Joseph Smith also said, Oh, I beseech you to go forward, go forward and make your calling and election sure. President Ezra Taft Benson said, Now there is a lifetime goal to walk in his steps, to perfect ourselves in every virtue as he has done, to seek his face and to work to make your calling and election sure. Joseph Anderson, assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, said, And what is that life-giving purpose, that goal toward which we should all be striving? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ as restored to man and this great dispensation. It is, of course, necessary that we have the physical necessities of life. It is natural that we should want the things that make life, physical life, desirable and pleasurable. But if in obtaining such things we neglect those things that are of eternal worth, the spiritual part of life, then we have mistaken the chaff for the wheat of life. We have failed to recognize the eternal purpose of our existence. We have neglected the cement, which is necessary if we are to build a life that will make our calling and election sure. Yes, eternal life in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Joseph Smith also counseled the saints to seek for this gift. I would exhort you to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it. Hebrews 10, 21, and having such an high priest over the house of God. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to an high priest over the house of God, said an high priest over the church, both on earth and in heaven. Christ is the great high priest whose atoning sacrifice was the culmination of all the sacrifices of all the high priests in Israel from the beginning of their nation to the day he hung on the cross. Hebrews 10.22 Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled or purified 
from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to heart sprinkled bodies washed, said, An apparent allusion to those ordinances whereby the saints of the new covenant are made clean through conformity to the Lord's law, even as Aaron and his sons were washed in the days of the old covenant. Hebrews 10, 23-25 Let us hold fast the profession of our faith or hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider or understand one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to exhorting one another, said the saints have an obligation to exhort and teach one another. And referring to the day, said the second coming. Hebrews 10, 26-27 For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries elder bruce r mcconkey said there is no forgiveness for those who receive a perfect knowledge of the truth and who then sin willfully and defy the truth hebrews 10 28-29 he that despised or rejected or violated moses's law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite or insult unto the Spirit of grace. Paul taught that those who sinned willfully, knowing their actions are wrong, will experience much sore punishment because they disrespect the sacrifice of the Son of God. In the pamphlet For the Strength of Youth, we read, some people knowingly break God's commandments, planning to repent later, such as before they go to the temple or serve a mission. Such deliberate sin mocks the Savior's atonement. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Every member of the church must live as becometh the saint, or suffer the consequences, for there is a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation. Yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed also. Even though a person has his calling and election made sure and is sealed up unto eternal life, he still has his agency. He can still fall. He can still choose to serve Satan. But if he does, having had a perfect knowledge of the truth, and now choosing to defy God, to trample his son underfoot, and to despite the spirit of grace, he is damned eternally as a son of perdition. Joseph Smith said, if men have received the good word of God and tasted of the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again, seeing they have crucified the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So there is a possibility of falling away. You could not be renewed again, and the power of Elijah cannot seal against this sin, for this is a reserve made in the seals and power of the priesthood. Hebrews 10, 30-31 For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, It is a fearful thing to suffer the wrath of God, with the devil and his angels in eternity, to be cast into the lake of fire, to die the second death, to be tortured where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, to become a son of perdition. Hebrews 10, 32-33 But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to reproaches and afflictions, said, Such are the common lot of all the saints in all ages. None can forsake the world without being reproached and afflicted by those who are worldly. Hebrews 10, 34-35 For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoils of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have 
in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. It should be remembered that Hebrews was written to church members who were wondering whether it would be better to return to the Jewish faith. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland spoke of the challenges faced by the Hebrew saints and likened the message of Hebrews to us. Paul says to those who thought a new testimony, a personal conversion, a spiritual baptismal experience would put them beyond trouble. To these, he says, call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were eliminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Then this tremendous counsel, which is at the heart of my counsel to you, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. That is the way it has always been, Paul says, but don't draw back. Don't panic and retreat. Don't lose your confidence. Don't forget how you once felt. Don't distrust the experience you had. This opposition turns up almost any place something good has happened. It can happen when you are trying to get an education. It can hit you after your first month in your new mission field. It certainly happens in matters of love and marriage. It can occur in situations related to your family, church callings, or career. With any major decision, there are cautions and considerations to make. But once there has been illumination, beware the temptation to retreat from a good thing. If it was right when you prayed about it and trusted it and lived for it, it is right now. Don't give up when the pressure mounts. Certainly don't give in to that being who is bent on the destruction of your happiness. Face your doubts. Master your fears. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Stay the course and see the beauty of life unfold for you. Hebrews 10, 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Knowing the struggles the Hebrew saints were facing, Paul exhorted his readers to be patient. The word patience in Hebrews 10 and 12 is translated from a Greek word meaning endurance or perseverance. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discussed patience and the part it plays in enduring to the end. Paul wrote of how even after faithful disciples had done the will of God, they had need for patience. How many times have good individuals done the right thing initially only to break under subsequent stress? Sustaining correct conduct for a difficult moment under extraordinary stress is very commendable, but so is coping with sustained stress subtly present in seeming routineness. Either way, however, we are to run with patience the race that is set before us. And it is a marathon, not a dash. You might invite family members to share spiritual experiences when they felt illuminated with truth. How can these experiences help you cast not away, therefore, your confidence in times of trial or doubt? Hebrews 10, 37-39 For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, or ruin, or destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to them who draw back unto perdition, said, Those who turn from righteousness serve Satan and become his sons, sons of perdition. Blood is that physical substance that renews the, and energizes the body, carrying to it food and nourishment and eliminating waste materials. In the resurrection, we will receive a perfected physical body, sometimes referred to as a spiritual body. This does not mean that such a body has no tangible substance, but rather that it is quickened by spirit and not by blood. The immortal body is quickened by spirit, but the mortal body is quickened by blood. In the scriptures, we are told that the life of the flesh is the blood. It was stated clearly to Moses, Only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 states, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. 
There can be no mistake that the blood anciently offered upon the altar of sacrifice was a direct reminder of the sacrifice of the Savior. Furthermore, the ancient prophets understood that it was blood that made atonement for their sins possible. The Latter-day Saints believe in the efficacy of the blood of Christ. They believe that through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, they obtain a remission of sins. But this could not be if Christ had not died for them. If you did believe in blood atonement, I might ask you why the blood of Christ was shed, and in whose stead was it shed? I might ask you to explain the words of Paul, without shedding of blood is no remission. When was Christ's blood shed for you? Was it on the cross, or was there another time, another place, where he trembled because of pain and blood at every pore, and prayed that the time of agony might pass? Did he know you then as an individual? And did he willingly suffer there for you, for your personal sins? Perhaps you would like to stop now for a moment and consider the testimony of the prophets Isaiah and Abinadi. Ponder the meaning of Isaiah 14, 1 and 10, and 15, 10 and 11. How would the Savior feel about someone for whom he suffered, who refused, through pride and arrogance, to accept his sacrifice and partake of his redeeming power? Through faith in Christ and the efficacy of his atonement, there is a quality of spiritual life fostered within the soul of the believer. This spiritual enlivening is directly associated with the process of personal sanctification. The following statements further clarify the meaning in which the sanctifying powers of the atonement can refine the lives of men and women. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said to be sanctified is to become clean, pure, and spotless, to be free from the blood and sins of the world. To become a new creature of the Holy Ghost, one whose body has been renewed by the rebirth of the Spirit. Sanctification is a state of saintliness, a state attained only by conformity to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The plan of salvation is the system and means provided whereby men may sanctify their souls and thereby become worthy of a celestial inheritance. Those who attain this state of cleanliness and perfection are able, as occasion may require, to see God and view the things of his kingdom. The three Nephites were sanctified in the flesh, that they were holy, and that the powers of the earth could not hold them. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Men can only be saved and exalted in the kingdom of God in righteousness. Therefore, we must repent of our sins and walk in the light as Christ is in the light that his blood may cleanse us from all sins, and that we may have fellowship with the Lord and receive of his glory and exaltation. What heart could but melt in love and gratitude for the Savior and the sacrifice of his blood, with which we must become so personally involved? As the Spirit distills quietly upon the soul, and we are drawn near the Master, the realization that we are completely dependent upon him dawns upon us. How could one such as he care for us so much that he would desire to provide an infinite atonement in our behalf, and yet he does. Your key to becoming perfect in Christ is found through faith and obedience, which leads to being born again. Then comes the mighty change in us or in our hearts that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. Then only one step remains, ultimately to bring about this final change that Christ suffered for you. This is described in Alma 13, 11 through 13. Therefore, they are called after this holy order and were sanctified, and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Now they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. And there were many, exceedingly great many, who were made pure and entered into the rest of the Lord their God. And now, my brethren, I would that ye should humble yourselves before God and bring forth fruit met for repentance, that ye may also enter into that rest. This is your promise. It can happen to you if you will begin now to exercise your faith and obey him, who has already prepared the way for your sanctification and eternal life. <laughs>